So welcome once again to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. The Legendino is in sunny Rio. Um, it's still morning there where you are, isn't it? It's one o'clock in the afternoon. The oh, sun okay. is pretty much at its highest and I'm surrounded by a nation complaining about the heat. What is the matter with these people? <laughs> Mate, don't wind us up too much on this, Tim. Um, it's uh, another autumn storm here, uh, but at least we've got daylight, unlike some people indeed, in the indeed. frozen... Lord north. Byron! Lord <laughs> Byron! John right. Keats! William Shakespeare, <laughs> your language took uh, a hell of a beating. Oh, very good. Oh, I like the way you did that. I was simply going to say... Uh, Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen, and The Father, his most famous piece. No, or was it A Doll's House is probably his most famous uh, play. But Father is much better because the father of Scandinavian mm -hmm. football journalism is with us uh, tonight. Okay, easy to on talk the father. About a father bit. and son situation. Have we, have, have we not let him into the Zoom yet? I mean, what's happening here, Dawson? <laughs> <laughs> We're coming to you. We're coming to you. Lars Sieverston has just put together um, a book, a biography of the most... Um, is he the most... He's not the most famous footballer of today, but arguably, Tim, he's the most efficient centre-forward of his generation. It looks like he's playing a different sport, doesn't he? And, he? and I'm sure he's the most famous Norwegian ever born in England. <laughs> That's a good point. So, uh, Lars Sieverston, welcome to the Brazilian Shirtling podcast. Tell us about this biography, first of all, about Erling Haaland. He comes from up your street. He does, and I will in a second, but since you've insisted on saying much too generous things about you, I do need to sort of slip in. A bit of return praise there. Saying it's absolutely brilliant to be on a, on any sort of platform or medium with you guys because I do. Being back in, I'm back in Norway at the moment, and it's really put me sort of in touch with my my roots and my youth. And I very clearly remember being at university, uh, listening to the World Football Phone in as I was sort of trudging up and down mountains to stay in shape. Uh, that, that's kind of how, and it and it was hugely hugely inspiring. And I, I went on to sort of make a living. Uh, Mostly writing about English football and covering English football for Norwegians. And many a time have I approached the subject thinking, how would Tim Vickery talk about this subject? How would Tim Vickery approach this when I'm trying to convey something back to my home country? So, uh, I'll tell you how he would approach on... it. He would, he would get someone else to do all the hard work and then take the credit. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, obviously, good... I've, I have picked up that much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I've been paying it's attention in class. Good, so being on anything with you guys, point. it's it is real, real bucket list stuff for me. So thanks for having me very much. It's very, very kind of you. Yeah. It's a really good journalistic, football journalistic point, though, because you have been on the World Football phone-in at the BBC many, many moons ago. And how, mm -hmm. how Lash was introduced to me, Tim, by our good friend, the top brass, Andy Brassel, was... This is the world's expert on Zlatan, Zlatan Ibrahimovic. And it has proved to be the fact. Now, what I did you want to dispute that, Lars? Surely not. I mean, you know, you've lived in Scandinavia, Dalton, so you know as well as I do, when you say something uh, that uh, complimentary about any Scandinavian person, he will immediately object. We do not take compliments very well, but I'm <laughs> going to try to restrain that. <laughs> Particularly uh, for if the you moment. come from the area of Norway that Erling Haaland comes from, um, they don't waste... Leeds? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. It's a fa okay. Let's address that one. Let's get this one off Mr. Vickery's chest. Lars Stevenson, can you explain how the most famous Norwegian was born in Leeds? <laughs> Quite simply, because his father was uh, was Alfie Holland, who 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 played for. Uh, who had just joined City that summer, actually, when uh, when Ali Holland was born? Uh, he that's that's the uh, uh, he joined Manchester City, but he was you know he had been playing for Leeds for a couple of seasons, uh, having played of course for Nottingham Forest before that. And uh, Alfie Holland was part of what was a Tim will remember this very well this sort of strange wave of Nordic invaders who came to to, to English football many years after the Viking, of course, had been well, over. I remember an, similar... an Icelandic right. We had an yes. Icelandic right back, Gudni Bergson. Of course, yeah. Gudni Bergson. Yeah, 
and I was and, going to say and, it, it, it's a northern, uh, you know, we call it the north in Scandinavia, northern, what you call Scandinavia, but it's beyond Scandinavia because it also mm, takes in Iceland. It's Nordic. And remember, significantly, their um, leagues operated in a slightly different time schedule, which is why we were able to get a lot of players from over that side or the far north playing in the English leagues because, you know, this was extra time for them. Yeah, this, right? so this was, you know, so there was a time when in the 90s in particular, early to mid 90s, where quite a few Scandinavian Norwegians in particular started coming over. That's uh, and, and, and part of that was, I mean, I, I spoke to people for the book. Why, why did that happen? And the answer was, was pretty simple. It's good attitudes and low prices. Like the, the Norwegian players, their wage demands were, were you know, sensible compared to a lot of other players you could have. In the worst case that scenario, you got, a, you got a big, strong Nordic fella who was a strong athlete and didn't drink too much and behaved himself. And some of them turned out to be really good. And worst case scenario, you get a good guy in training who's not too much of a problem around the, around the place. Um, there was also a, a slightly controversial uh, agent, Mr. Runa Haugu, who was very active at the time, uh, who, who who had very good connections in the English game as as time went by, and who facilitated a lot of these transfers uh, and and did a lot, of course, to because this was in the day, you know, before all the sort of scouting became as sophisticated as it is now. So a lot of these things were done by personal relationships as well. So I actually do think Mr. Haugu's role in in that sort of part of Norwegian football history is a little bit under uh, appreciated sometimes. But for sure, in the mid '90s, there were a lot of them. One of them was Alfie Holland. He played for Nottingham Forest, Leeds, and Manchester City. And the summer he joined Manchester City, he had a son named Erling. Uh, who would go on to eclipse him in in many ways? One might say. Well, one of the the striking things here for me is yeah, I, I remember the Nordic invasion, and they were pretty much a job lot. Most of them weren't they? They, they? they were, they were solid, uninspirational figures. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the son is on a completely different level. From the father and, and the father's generation. How on earth do we explain that when we're watching him, we are watching someone who looks like he's playing a different sport? It's true. And it is something I remember, again, when the rumor was starting to spread when Erling was very young, that one of Alfie's Fallen's kids was scoring a lot of goals at youth level, like an unusual, quite freakish amount of goals. There was some... Amongst the more cynical football observers, people went, "Well, that doesn't scan. <laughs> that, that doesn't seem to make sense." Well, as uh, as, as, as as David Batty's son, an, an incredibly technically <laughs> gifted number ten, like what, <laughs> what is uh, is Gary Doherty's offspring a sort of unstoppable <laughs> wing wizard? Like that doesn't seem to make a ton of sense. But Erling, from a very young age, when we have this one lovely interview with him when he was just a kid, when he was asked by a local journalist, "Why are you?" So good at scoring goals because you've clearly not learned that from your dad. He couldn't score goals, and he does make a joke about saying, "No, oh, I've not learned it from him, but I've learned everything else from him." And he talks about wanting to score goals because that's where it happens. But it is strange, and and that's something I had to. This is a poor sales pitch, but it's a it's a side of it that I don't. There's no definitive answer to this in the book. Where does this come from? Everyone although, just says that that's what that's what he wanted to do from day one. He wanted to be a striker. Although, and he wanted to score goals. I would say in the book you do hint at. A couple of things um mm. on the one hand and you will know the obvious difference tim between a, a long tall uh scandinavian blonde-haired blue-eyed figure and a more center of gravity low center of gravity uh, south american footballer the tall scandinavian has got an advantage and you do hint at his physical uh, of him as a physical specimen that is, at the very least, uh, built for football or built for scoring goals. And the other side of it, and you won't understand this, Tim, so forgive us for going into Scandinavia for just one moment. Don't forget, Lars, Anhart Lupper, he blew it. Yeah, he does. That's a great, that's a phrase that I, I, I love that I was able to put that in. Yeah, because not more than one per person used that exact phrase to me. Both his former teacher and his former youth youth coach. Yeah, he which literally translates into "he has fleas in his blood," which is a I phrase would, that applies to someone who's a little bit restless, not really built to sit still. I was going to, to say, 
he's got ants in his pants is what we yeah that, that's a that's a very good translation yeah and it's not a pejorative thing at any it's just it's not entirely uncommon for young boys but, but but for young boys he was particularly not one for sitting still he always he was always on the move always active always wanted things to happen and but, you can but, see but i think that we should in his play on the field so, sorry to cut you because the the game that you've asked us to look at um mm -hmm. which is as always with the brazilian shirt name podcast we look at a game from sometime in the annals of footballing history to discuss that to look back in time as it were and also to look at the sort of cultural significance of the times and mm. the game that you've asked us to look at which we'll come to in a moment i think is an exact specimen of having lupe i bluder yeah. that's the way we say it in sweden because yeah. the guy cannot keep still no and it's his movement apart from anything else that tears the opponent well, th th this, this is what if, it's what fascinates me because you, you draw you drew the distinction between the low center of gravity south american and the, and the, 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 the strapping nordic he's got both despite his physical build i mean th there are things of sergio aguero his predecessor in him as well he's just so unbelievably yeah. complete as a goal scoring machine hence the fact that he looks like he's, he's playing a different sport because it, it's just so easy to him and it's something it's a point that his former youth team coach makes in the book is that people say wow it's incredible that he's so fast and so big and strong and he says well you know what usain bolt's pretty big and strong and he's very fast that's not the trick the trick is being that size to have that to have that speed and also being able to turn quickly to be able because Usain Bolt needs a long, yeah, long runway yeah, to slow down football, at the end of it. Football pace is so different from athletic pace, isn't it? It's and, about and changes Usain of rhythm, Bolt, changes of direction. Usain Bolt found that out when he went to Australia. Yeah. It's not the same yeah. thing, you know. Although... And this is something that they, his coaches identified pretty early, or something that they focused on with his uh, youth team: changes of direction, stop, start, change direction. Because you know, it, it's no good being cut quick if you can't translate that into football relevant movements. And it's something that Erling Haaland is quite remarkable at, the extent to which he can, in spite of his size and the momentum that he can build up, he's still surprisingly nimble for a guy that size. That is that is unusual. And there is he does have the advantage as well of having, you know, quite apart from fleas in his blood, um, athleticism in his blood through his father, as we've known, a footballer himself, through his mother, who was mm -hmm. a successful athlete in her own right, mm -hmm. um, and through his grand grandmother as well, I believe. Yeah, grandmother and great uncle. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this because everyone knows about his father, of course, who's now a very visible presence in his life, has been a very important guiding hand. Absolutely, it's been a huge thing for him having a father who knows the industry and can warn him about some of the pitfalls and super helpful for him. But his mother doesn't get a lot of attention, partially because she's decided to keep a very low profile. But, but his mother, Jemma uh, Ithabaut, was a national champion at under-18 level at the women's heptathlon. Uh, which, uh, I, I, again, Dalton kindly informed me the other week, I don't necessarily need to inform uh, British people about the heptathlon because you're, you're quite familiar with the event. But for listeners who don't know, it's a it's a seven uh, event, uh, well, a seven discipline event in the uh, in the track and field which involves the 100-meter hurdles, the high jump, the shot put, the 200-meter, the long jump, the javelin throw, and the 800-meter. And you have to be good. So you have to be good at a lot of different things. You have to have a nicely honed sort of explosive uh, musculature with some stamina as well. But you also have to have the discipline to get good at the shot put and the, the, the javelin. You can't just pick that up. So it requires a lot. And if you're a national champion at 18 that, at that, that in your age group, you've, you've got something about you. And I did, in the research for the book, I found in the local athletic uh, club at Brune, where he grew up, in the local athletic club, you can go on their website and they have like historical records set by various age groups, all the way from like kids to teenagers. And half of those records, or quite a few of them certainly, were set by Aling Holland's mother in the 80s. But a good chunk of them were also set by Aling Holland's grandmother in the 60s. <laughs> so she was also quite the athletic specimen in her youth. And then you have the fact that the grandmother's brother is, is Gabriel Hailan, who was the greatest player in the local team's history, played over 500 games and was capped for Norway and was the sort of the kind of local legend that we don't really get in football anymore because they all move on for, for more money. But the sort of ins inspiration, I compare him in the book to a kind of Kevin Keegan character if Kevin Keegan also worked on the family farm. 
you know, it, it, he was the sort of sly number 10 type. So he has this incredible athletic pedigree genetically, but also in the sense that his surroundings growing up, he grew up with people all around him who knows what it takes to be an athlete. And I think obviously that will have helped him quite a lot. So he started off at a, a Norwegian club. Well, he started off at youth levels, but he, his first sort of like professional gig uh, was with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, wasn't it? At, um, is yeah. it M M M Mulder. Merby? Merby? Mulder. Mulder. Mulder, yeah, Mulder, Mulder, sorry. I'm thinking in That's Swedish fine. now, aren't I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you Mulder. are. You often do. Yeah. I can't help it when you speak Scandinavian. But um and, and some of those experiences that he went through in oh Sweden God. leave <laughs> leave a mark yeah, leave as we know from uh, from <laughs> yes. his memoirs. I uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um it's called Efreeze, by the way. I can actually say this on this podcast, unlike elsewhere. It's called Efreeze, and it's amazing. And if I might just go off on a quick anecdote, I've just come back from posting a few copies at the local post office to people. Um, post and packaging free. Yeah, it doesn't cost you an extra penny uh, to get it from the author. But um, I've just come back, and I bumped into the the postman who I managed to sell a copy to when he came by once. And so I, I, he was walking down the hill. I was walking up the hill, and I saw this look on his face. He saw me, and I said, yeah, you've read it, haven't you? You've read it. <laughs> He goes, yeah, I've read up to page 111. And I said, oh, well, it's just about to begin, by the way. Oh, and <laughs> Johnny Wanker hasn't even entered the story. <laughs> well, Johnny Wanker comes there, and he's very important in the story. Um, but the the um, the postman says, yeah, I can see it's autobiographical because that Tesco's over there. That was the orange tree, wasn't it? That was the orange tree. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. So um, just to let you know that he loves it, just to let you know, I'm not boosting it. Anyway, back to Erling Haaland, much more important, and your book, Haaland, your biography. Um, isn't it the case, though, that he left Norway or he went abroad Really, he went to live abroad for the first time when he left Molde and went to yeah. Austria initially. Yes, Austria. Yeah, N well, yeah. And I want to. Yeah, we don't have. Sadly, don't have time to do the entire book. Yeah, I suppose that's what the audio book is for. But um, well, <laughs> very briefly, I think the initial move to Molde is worth touching on in a sentence or two because, again, when he left his hometown club of Buena, he was breaking into the first team, but they got demoted to the third tier, and it was already clear that that wasn't where he should be as a sixteen-year-old. He was better than that. And at that time, he'd done enough at youth uh, for the second team for youth international teams to to get attention. And there was attention from Hoffenheim in the Bundesliga. He could have gone abroad already before, well, just as he was to, uh, turning sixteen, or after turning sixteen. Um, but but they decided to stay in Norway. They decided to go to Molde, who were coached by Olga Solskjaer, not a bad manager to learn from for a young striker. And also from a club that had a history of developing young players and sending them abroad. Not a lot of superstars, but if you go through the sort of last 20 years, quite a lot of teenagers have gone to Molde, spent a few seasons and gone on to have good contracts abroad. So it's, it's seen as a good finishing school. And at Molde, I'm not going to dwell on it, but they make one little decision that I've been thinking about it really since writing the book, that it makes such a huge difference, which is their uh, physical coach at the time, Bo Stensley, a former center half, basically looked at Holland and figured, we're not going to do a lot of strength work with you. You know, you're going to be strong enough. That's not going to be a problem. We're going to work on explosivity. We're going to work on speed. We're going to work on agility. Mm -hmm. so they did no, very, basically no time in the weight room. None of that. It just worked on this flexibility because they figured the strength is going to be fine. Uh, and, and I just look back at that, that. That's such a key decision for someone to make in his career. Because they could have bulked him up and made him like the second coming of Jan Kohler or something. And it's just, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure he would have scored an absolute bucket load of goals in the Scandinavian leagues. But I don't think he would have had that kind of global impact if they hadn't really just laser focused on making him quick and working on his agility. And 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 it kind of shows it's such a small thing, but it kind of shows the value of picking the right club early in your career and getting to people who understand how to do these sort of things. And, and arguably, eventually, it's the pick of the next club, which yeah. is the more crucial decision that he makes. Yeah. Um, and this brings us onto this game that we're going to talk about as well. That. The the move from Austria, Salzburg was it? It was with yeah. in Austria, Salzburg to Dortmund is mm -hmm. arguably the most important footballing decision of his career because, as I understood it from your book, there were several other 
um, you know, European top European teams sniffing around after yeah. him, uh, Juventus on the one hand, but then you suggest that Manchester United already had dibs on him before Manchester City. Well, United were supposedly interested. I, I mean, Solskjaer has said later on that he called United about him even at Mulvin, even at that point. He said, like, I have a kid here who's uh, who's got the world at his feet. But at that point, he was a very unpolished gem. And I think the way the, the way this the way Solskjaer has told the story quite recently, the way he suggested it was that they didn't come up with the money and they didn't back him. I wonder if they would have sent him to Manchester United directly from Norway or even from Salzburg because they've been so focused on making the moves that are the correct ones for his career. Uh, of, of, of they when they went to Molde, they could have gone to Hoffenheim. When they gone went to Salzburg from Molde, they could have gone to Juventus. They could have. I'm sure English clubs would have taken him at that point. They've looked where is the best place for him to develop. That's the only thing that that's, they've really prioritized. Figuring you know if it goes well, the money will take care of itself. You know, if it goes well, start the sky's the limit. So they went to Leipzig, went to Salzburg because they also have a great history of being this conveyor belt of, of talent. And he has this explosive autumn there when he starts banging in goals in the Champions League and just making Austrian teams look very foolish. And 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 in the January window, it's clear like he has completely outgrown the Austrian league already. There's no sense and there's no point to him spending any more time there. But at that point, he can already pick and choose really from pretty much any club. I mean, there are very few clubs who, if you approach them in that January and says Erling Holland is interested, I think they would have made the deal happen. And that will. You know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was in charge of Manchester United then. So, I mean, there, there's an obvious sort of link there. He has said this on the record, Holland, is that I've never chosen a club for the manager. Because you can choose a club for the manager and three months later, the manager gets fired. And then you're sat there going, well, that was a bad idea. You have to look at other factors. And at Dortmund, it was simple in the sense that they didn't have a striker. Uh, they, 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 had, they didn't really have a center forward at the club. Uh, Lucien Favre uh, had been experimenting with all kinds of strange false number nine solutions uh, in the first half of the Bundesliga season that hadn't really worked out. And it was the case of the club really sensing we need, whether Favre wants it or not, we need a striker here. we got to buy a number nine. Uh, so, but they, so, they did uh, have a supply line called Jaden and, Sancho. And, and, and that's the thing. They had no striker, but they had Jaden Sancho. You know, they had Dogen Hazard was there. You know, Marco Royce was there. A lot of creative sort of tippy tappy footballers, as they say, uh, who could put the ball on a plate for him. There was no number nine to knock it in. So again, Holland has spoken about this. Uh, Holland really liked how direct they were when they spoke to him. They just said, "We need you. There's no striker in our team. You know, we want you to come and sign for us." And he was like, "Yeah, that that sounds good." So he comes in and scores a hat-trick off the bench on his debut against Augsburg because it's such an obvious match, that Dortmund team and him. And I spoke to a Dortmund season ticket holder for the book, for the, who Uli Hesse, who I'm sure you're familiar with, very good writer and uh, a journalist, who, and a Dortmund season ticket holder who said, Dortmund fans online were kind of joking that they were 2-0 two nil, two nil down to Augsburg. Well, that's okay, because Holland's going to come on and score a hat-trick. Uh, they were joking during the game. And then he did! <laughs> Because it was just uh, it was just absolutely perfect. He had this array of creative players who just needed someone to knock the ball in, and and there he was, and and so he did. And in this this Champions League campaign, I think he scores almost every goal that Dortmund manage. Yeah, no, he becomes he becomes absolutely integral immediately, and 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 this is the game I picked for the episode. If we're going to zero in on one game, because it, I think as much as he's achieved since. I, I think it remains my favorite sort of Alling Holland memory. And I, I, I realize I've, I've spoken so much about this the last few months. I've, I've, I've kind of buried the lead in the sense that I, I grew up in the same town as him in Norway, in Buna, which is a town of 12,000 people. Uh, so obviously, when you try to do what I try to do for a living and a scrawny kid from your town becomes the best forward in the world, then that's a bit of a freebie. I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. doesn't usually happen that way. Uh, and um, so, so I've obviously taken an interest for a while. And I do remember this is one of, I, I wish I'd been there, but uh, I, I was watching this in, in my living room and just jumping up and down just because it's, it's, it's the game where you got the sense that really... There is no ceiling to this guy. Like, there's, there's no, because everything before that game had been, yeah, he'd scored a lot of goals in Norway. Who cares? He, he scored nine against Honduras in the under 21, uh, under 20 championships. You know, the, the, the Honduras kind of fell apart a bit in that game. You know, it happens. 
then he scored a lot of goals in Austria. I was like, yeah, okay. And even in the Champions League, you know, he scored a hat trick against Ghent, but you know, okay, that can happen. But, but this was against PSG. This was a knockout game against Pelé Saint Germain. And as Dalton has and, alluded and it, to it's, earlier, it's clearly, I think, the best PSG that there's been up to this I, point. I think that's a really, I think that's a really important point here as well. As much as PSG have often appeared a slightly ludicrous construct, this was a good PSG, uh, coached by Thomas Tuchel, a very good manager. Who, who had a bit of history with Dortmund, by the way, he was at Dortmund and was kind of sent away, not necessarily because of results, but because he kind of fell out with everyone. So I think for Dortmund, there was a little bit of extra sort of rumble. It's, it's not a lot of fun for the for them to get knocked out by this guy. That would worry. They, they definitely wanted to win for that reason. GSG culturally very much the different kettle of fish to Dortmund who are very sort of in, trying to stay in touch with their roots whilst being a global football entity as well. PSG just kind of yeah, we can talk about PSG a lot. I'm sure you've done that, but they are what they are. They, that year, yeah, under Tuchel, they were good. They had a lot of good things going for them. Well, they got and Di Maria it's, it's, as well in, in in the front three. Oh, so you haven't got excellent. Well, he you haven't got three egos, have you? Yeah. Like, Di Maria. No, is, you've got is, this. Is the amazing thing about him, he's a great player without the, the, the ego of a, of a great player. So he'll he'll do what's necessary. Yeah, yeah. Um, so everything is so everything is set. It's Holland's first big, 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 big test, and everyone's kind of heard the tales and seen the YouTube highlights. But this, I would argue, it's the first single game where the eyes of the world really pay attention. I think and it's huge. I think for, you're it, right. Yeah. I think you're right. I think um, whatever else he did before pales into somewhat insignificance after this moment. Uh, thank goodness he got his hair cut for this one, <laughs> and and he kind of like looks normal. Um, I'm not sure. This if was that... he had he had that was his hair. He this was pre uh, long haired Viking mode Holland. This is what he looked like then. And even yeah. just revisiting revisiting the extended highlights of this before this pod just to remind myself of all the things. It's if fascinating he, he, how much it's fascinating how much he still looks like a boy here. Like he yeah. still looks like an overgrown mm. boy. He's already yeah, he's quick, he he's playing, got some strength, but he looks like a completely different person to what he does now. I think if he was an Italian player, the ponytail wouldn't be a problem for me. But it's just something <laughs> like but that aside, if I can just wheel back for a moment, because sometimes in this game, in this journalism game, sometimes you make your own luck. And sometimes your luck makes you. So you were in the right place at the right time for Zlatan, as I've hinted at before. And then, as you've already said, you were in the right town at the right time for this bloke. And it reminds me of journalists. You know, sometimes I know a journalist. She's not with us anymore. She she died. But she was an amazing BBC journalist who went off and decided to freelance and uh, she knew already she was dying at the time by the way but um she decided to go off and freelance and she had this knack of being at the right place at the right time so she'd be the journalist who was in moscow when the wall was falling down or she'd be in the balkans just as civil war was breaking out in the balkans you know you seem to have been in the right place at the right time from a footballing oh. perspective but even you i imagine couldn't have imagined or couldn't have envisaged that he was going to take this particular match and own it because you, it, we've already mentioned Mbappe is playing here. You know, we've already mentioned that Neymar is playing here. There's at least mm -hmm. two other people who are going to be competing for him in terms of goals. And, and look, they look are... who he's, he's against. The, you know, the Paris Saint Germain defenders. He's got Thiago Silva and Marquinhos there, and King, yeah. uh, the, 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 the fellow with the MBE. Yeah. No, I mean, and and that was you know, sorry, I missed Thiago that. Silva. Mm -hmm. The MB. Always one one. What you got an MB? Kim Kim MB. Yeah. Apologies, I missed. I'm slow. Sorry, go on. <laughs> I think this is about and, me again. And, and this is Thiago Silva that. near the near the absolute peak of his powers as well. You know, he's one of the best center halves in the world at the time. Uh, so so it is a huge challenge. And what I'd like to, I'm not sure to what extent Tim remembers this specifically, but I'd like to ask you about. The, the Neymar of it all, because this was a big moment for him, because one of the reasons, of course, he, he went to PSG, as well, remember, was to escape from Messi's shadow and try to make a claim for the throne and all this. And you have to do that through the Champions League, because no one will ever, as we're learning with Mbappe, no one will ever be really seen as the man while you're playing in Liga, I don't think. 
Uh, I'm not sure that's possible. Mm. So it's all about these Champions League runs. But he had such a rotten luck with injury. You know, he very often ended up missing the key games because of injury. Injury, sadly, played a big part in, in Neymar's career. Um, it must have been a big night for him as well, in that sense. Well, um, this is it's the best PSG. It's the one that got all the way to the final. Uh, and it's I think it's such a great illustration of the tragedy of Neymar. Because um, in that final against Bayern... From the point that Bayern score the goal, his game absolutely collapses. He can't do it. And he's playing quite well up until that point. And then after that, it's like he hasn't been prepared for defeat. And so what Neymar represents is not only, I think that there's an element of tragedy in him, but there's a wider element of tragedy of, of Brazilian society. Because what he isn't is a street footballer. So many of those spaces of the old-fashioned street fo footballers have been eaten up by urban expansion and, and, and urban violence. So, you know, you get the kids inside into, into a safe environment, futsal. And Neymar, as someone who's been hothoused from a very, very early age, uh, to be the man, I think he's, a th I think inside him, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a thoroughly decent person his teammates, most of them seem, seem to really like him. Mm. And then it certainly don't see him as a luxury player, but he's been spoiled from a, from a very early age. And I think you saw that temperamentally in the final against Bayern when he can't cope with the fact that his side's losing. But also there's a wider point about football in that his interpretation of the game is that it's a non-contact sport. And, uh, and so often he gets fouled because he's looking for the foul. He wants to draw the foul. The street footballer has to know, especially if you're talented and frail, you know when to get red, get rid of the ball, you know, and you know when to go for the dribble. And that's the way that you, you, you preserve yourself. He doesn't have that. Survival. He'll often draw the foul and then he gets more and more irritated and he will kick out. He will he will be the one to leave it leave leave his little foot in, and you see so many of these things in this mm. game. You see him coming in for for, for some heavy treatment, and he always acts as, as if this is some something personal against him. You know, this has been the way of football since football was football. If you're a, it's a con, it's a contact sport, and the player that the, the players these days are far far more protected than they ever were before. Although although the game is is, is faster and, and and more intense, so he 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 comes in from some rough, some rough treatment and he doesn't react well to it. And it, so it, it's like, although we do need to mention that PSG win the second leg two 0 and, and and progress mm -hmm. in, in in the competition, so they they would say that eventually the victory was theirs. But you're seeing as well as some fantastic football from him because he's a wonderful footballer. He's capable of doing things and seeing things that others can't see. And his mind just works so, so quickly. But you're seeing so many ele elements of the tragedy of him. Uh, and the, obviously, the, these are physical questions that Holland will never will, will never be raised against Holland because he's built differently. And he's also built for the conflict, isn't he? I mean, it, it, he has no problem whatsoever as football, as a, as a sport of conflict and a contact sport. He's one of those fantastic players who, if you want to be tough with him, he can be tough. Mm. You want to but, play, he can play more than you can. That, that That's what makes him so complete. It, isn't yeah. it also, though, uh, Lars, that um, you describe it so playfully almost about his attitude to football, that for him... Just being there, and this match, by the way, for those who are listening, we haven't said it's the 18th of February, 2020, Dortmund versus PSG uh, in the Champions League uh, first leg at Dortmund. But you you describe it so playfully that for him, he's just got this, you know, somewhat. Uh, I mean, you don't say, but I'll use the word puerile grin on his face. Yeah. You know, because he's just. He's just chuffed to be there, or he's not chuffed. That's not the right word. He's, he's like a kid in a sweet shop, isn't he? That um, this is he's going to have a lot of fun today. Is the way that his attitude towards the game is not win or lose. I'm sure he wants to win. It's not that, 
But him he being all there, that pressure on role, him that Neymar no. has, you know, because yeah. with Neymar, you've got to be the best in the world. You've got go to, for and your career has failed yeah. if you're not if you're not the best in the world. Yeah. And that that has been such a cross for for him to carry. There's none of this with Nate with with, with, with Holland, and you get those. I'm always fascinated to learn about this. So those kind of Zen celebrations. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where does all where does all yeah. that come from? Well, th this was, um, he had gotten into meditation in a big way. Uh, not, well, I think that's quite recent. I, certainly, I know in when he was in Austria, he was sort of, one of his teammates remarked that uh, uh, in, in the bus from away games, you know, other teammates will be playing cards maybe or just celebrating and relaxing. And, you know, 19-year-old Erling Holland would be sat at the back of the bus reading about meditation. You know, he, he, he has that kind of focus on self-improvement. And and he has found that meditation is something that works for him in taking his in, in in centering himself off the pitch. He's spoken quite a lot actually about how to do what he does in the in, in on the pitch. You know, his game is about moments. You know, he is not someone who is involved for ninety minutes. He doesn't play as many passes as a midfielder. He doesn't have you know ten to twelve twelve uh, fifty fifties to win like a center half. For him, whether he has had a good week or not depends on whether he has a perfect touch and a perfect finish when the ball comes to him two or three times throughout the game. And That's is what that, it's all about. It, it, is, is and he, it and he has about to be because he does seem to have a little bit more skill. He, he than does just do, first but, but, touch and bang. that's true. But it well, is look, the look, sharp at, end look at this of... game. Look at look at the two yeah. goals. First yeah. goal, close finish, made to look easy because he lifts it. Close yeah. finish, first time right foot. Second goal outside the area, makes a little bit of space, crash on his left foot. Uh, they're, they're, they're two very different goals. And two and you very can different. See the goalkeeper yeah. on the second one, the goalkeeper, given that he's whacked it in from outside the area, it's literally passing the goalkeeper, and the goalkeeper's not watching. Whoops! I better go yeah. for it. And, uh, but, but, but the first one is actually a great example of what I was talking on, talking about, because he scores a lot of tap ins. But there's a reason for that. He's so incredibly alert in those moments, and he doesn't chase. It's the old saying for strikers, you should never chase a potential rebound. You know, that you're too late if you're looking for rebounds. You, know, you should chase every shot, assuming that there might be a rebound. You know, ch chase every, everything that might drop from the goalkeeper you should be at. Don't wait for the rebound. Go for the potential rebound. And he's so on his front foot with these moments. And, he's, that's, and that's where the meditation comes in. He talks about how he needs to be so extremely switched on for those 90 minutes. It, it, he's on the field, it then becomes very important for him to switch off completely in his life off the field. He says, I have to be extreme in, in terms of relaxing, just as I have to be extreme in terms of being switched on. That's so much of what he yeah. does. And and that and that's where the meditation comes in, I think. As, I'm as sure, a way for I'm, him of, yeah. I'm sure we're all agreed that the sitting down on the pitch as a goal celebration doesn't work, yeah? Well, um, well, you saw that for the second goal, right? Because in the first yeah. goal, he does this, and he and, and that really wounds the PSG players up. They don't like that at all, and we see well, this in the second leg. Like they it. all do it. <laughs> Never mind the PSG but, players. <laughs> but notice for the celebration for the second goal when he's smacked it into the top corner, and even he doesn't understand what's going on now. He's gonna running out, running around with a face like a kid who does not understand what just happened. What did I just do? And he tries to do the lotus position, but he has so much momentum as he's running, and he's just gonna fall <laughs> over <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. that is. The, that is it's, the problem with the lotus yeah. position versus the and knee slide. For it's instance. also you can't. If, yeah. if you're a tall footballer, it's a long way down. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You haven't got all day, mate, for you to position yourself. But the match itself, um, where, how does that lead to him or catapult him? So he's introduced himself to the world now. How does that catapult him to the phenomenal goal scoring machine of Manchester City that we see? today is it a well, I think smooth it introduces, transition from, you know? you know, i think it introduces him to the world you know because before it was all oh he scored a lot of goals here and there and you've seen some of the goals on the internet and there's a lot of yeah and it, but i feel like this game kind of answered a lot of the counters in the sense that it's just against small teams it's just in an easy league all this sort of stuff but you do it against what tim has very correctly said is is the well i, I agree certainly is the best psg team and any talk of him being a tap-in merchant, which might still have st stood after the first goal, is very effectively silenced by the second goal. And actually, I would like to see him take more shots from range. Uh, he hardly ever does it, but but he 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 can he can massively hit he's them. Bit, I do wonder if he's, he's discouraged from doing it. 
Uh, yeah, he, no, he, he always you'll notice pool. this at Manchester City now. Whenever yeah. there's a teammate in any kind of promising position, he will pass, which is kind of unusual for someone who's a thoroughbred goal that? scorer. Yeah, why does he do that? I, I I do wonder. I think it's quite pronounced now because he's at Manchester City, who have a very clear method of how you build up and how you create these chances. I suspect Pep would not be super happy if he started smashing them from twenty four yards five times every no, game. No, but this is. I think, in I think he would have been. I think he would have been told by an angry area. Catalan. In yeah, and no, around the have... area where he's he's yeah. got the momentum, and clearly, if he whacks it in uh, with the v- velocity that you'd expect him to do it with, you know th- that would be a goal. But he takes one more touch by passing it on to somebody else, who may or may not score. Yeah, I would like I mean, to see think, him do, do I, I, I would like to see him do it more often. Sancho in this match. Sorry, I think he passed it on to Jaden Sancho at one point, and Jaden Sancho made nothing of it. Yeah, and that's why the City thing is not a fully satisfactory answer because he is also doing it at Dortmund. He's a surprisingly selfless guy. He, he will look for teammates. Maybe that is the Scandinavian in him. I mean, as much as he is, he's quite, in some ways, he's a little bit un-Scandinavian. He's much more single-minded uh, and, and than the sort of typical egalitarians. So, that, that's what you've specialized in, haven't you? You've specialized in untypical Scandinavians. With, 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 yeah, with I, him, I suppose, yeah. Right and, it, and, and it's interesting that you bring up Ibra because... He's clearly someone who uh, who Erling Haaland looked up to uh, as a youngster. Mm. Even though they're very, very different footballers, you can see a little bit of that swagger emerging now that he's becoming a little more confident. Does, uh, the does way that, he speaks, the way he carries back, himself. Backups in 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 Norway. Are there some that don't like this? That think not he's, he's... yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> it hasn't yet. I do wonder. As he keeps growing in confidence, keep being successful, and the novelty of a Norwegian player being one of the best in the world kind of wears off a little bit. I wonder, they will, inevitably, I'm sure there will be a Holland backlash. Mm-hmm. Um, his, fa- his, his father, Alfie, has, has, has decamped to Switzerland, which, uh, which uh, some people didn't take too kindly to in Norway and right. felt that wasn't the right thing for him to do. So there, there, there'll be a bit of stuff about this. For now, he's still, I think, we're a very proud footballing nation, and we went through a period of not having a lot of good players. Like we had a bit of a lost decade there. So suddenly having him and Martin Odegaard is kind of blowing our minds a little bit at the mm. moment, and is making any. I think people are too excited to be too perturbed by it. Okay. And as much as he is someone who is un-Norwegian in certain ways, and he kind of likes wearing quite flashy clothes and stuff like this, which is very un-Norwegian. Um, he's still quite down to earth in some ways. You know, he still talks up where he's from a lot, and he's still. You know his best friends are a He's group of mates who, who who from Mate, from back home. You can't you can't diss a man with an accent that sounds like he's one of the Wurzels, can you? You can't <laughs> actually say. <laughs> Look, mate, especially when he says this word, he's got is this word in drilla. Um, okay, yeah, drilla. Yeah, there's a few of this. Drilla. 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 That's, that's the word how he that, calls that's... it. He just drillas yeah. them in. You know. Yeah, and, and this is a thing that's a lot of foreign listeners will not be aware of. When Alan Holland speaks Norwegian, he has a very pronounced regional accent. Very, very strong so regional. Norwegians accent. are laughing their heads off already. And not really they, laughing, but more just kind of. I think there's a lot of respect there understand. for the fact that as well they do. Well, some they might occasionally have to look up the odd word. But the <laughs> point is, I think people have a lot of respect for the fact that even though he's become this global megastar, he will not moderate his accent or change Good the way him. he speaks just because someone sticks a microphone into his face. Like Good he will speak him. with the exact kind of language he would speak to his grandmother. Listen, um, mate. I wasn't dissing the Norwegian language. You know, one of my favorite words in Scandinavian is Norsk Rikskringskastning. Um, so I wasn't dissing your language, but I wanted to use drilla. Do you know how drilla. we... Drilla. Yeah. Um, I wanted to use that as a way of discussing the musical soundtrack of this week, of the 18th oh. of February 2020. Because there's a lot of drill uh, <laughs> music in the charts i think you saw what i did there okay yeah so this is what this is why you're this incredible <laughs> uh radio pro you know you, oh, you've done this for many it. years you know oh, it by heart. stop it unless you want to continue obviously <laughs> <Carry> <laughs> <on>. <laughs> um no for real though um i love this charts it's one of the best sort of contemporary charts or relatively contemporary charts that we've discussed. Tim, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and yours, obviously, Lars. Billie Eilish is at number one, No Time to Die, which I think was a 
Is it a James Bond thing? Yeah, on, the, like, the film, mm, the film, because of the, yeah. the pandemic is just about to strike, so the film doesn't come out for another eighteen months or so. Um, but th this, yeah, this was the thing, and th there's like a handful of these global stars are all over this chart. Oh, she's one of them. Louis Capaldi, Dua, Dua Lipa, uh, Dua Lipa, yeah, Justin Bieber. Yeah. Um, don't say it so dismissively well Hang i thought on. this was a, just a just a collection of bollocks frankly I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm struggling to see what you liked tim well last first bollocks how would you describe it i'm sure there's a norwegian word that's much much more suitable than bollocks well yeah but i'm I'm a little bit so this this feels not uh true to because Alan holland's uh, has got quite a modern taste in music so i'm sure the the stuff here that he would like but i'm i'm very much on the tim vickery end of the scale like there's not a lot for me here so uh i i would also well, be leaning towards bollocks i have to say I'm, no 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 it's not a norwegian <laughs> word you can't you can't nick out words get your own okay take bollocks no i'm surprised that you say that though Lars, because what tim is alluding to that this chart is filled with five or six big names that have four or five or six entries in the charts basically mm. what we're seeing is how the chart is being appropriated um the real estate has been absorbed in the way that google or amazon tries to uh absorb and um co-opt co all the real it's estate the, the, new technology it's just the psgification yeah. of the music industry is that what you're you saying? could say that but doesn't erling Haaland also to a certain extent have to um have to own the landscape in which he does his work just outside the but box he has to have teammates the box. He? Yes. he's got teammates it's, it's, has... it's a collective thing and well, the, one of the big themes for me i mean i, I know she's interesting but the, the billy eilish thing she's in she's she's a very interesting artist but uh, i can only take so much of this individualistic uh it's just too much for me. Mate, it's too... Why can't you just listen to it for the music? You know, because I don't you... like it for the music. I, I, there's you nothing. Don't. There's nothing there. I, I, I can see it it's being some, interesting. Melodies. But it, it, it reminds me. There's a mate of mine who teaches, uh, and I remember a few years ago him telling him, him saying, you know, a couple of generations ago, a generation or so ago, the kids they would all take sociology, and now now they take psychiatry. And Billie Eilish, I think, is a is is a consequence of of this. I don't really care that much about her individual problems. You know, it just it, she just seems to wallow in it okay. so much. How, and I think it's interesting, about, but I, I don't find it joyful. I don't find it, it, it nothing touches me. Well, it's not always going to be joyful. How about Lewis Capaldi? Even less. That's just mawkish. Oh, it's no. just a way. It's the waste of a voice. Well, Sing he's got a something. voice. He's got a distinct voice. And he ain't going to do much more with it than we've heard him do. But you know, if you try, you, if you take a track like "Before You Go," that's just one of the best written tracks of. It's you just know, mawkish. Last... I don't. I don't like mawkish. But I'm talking. I'm not talking about the mawkishness, which you could argue it has. But I'm just talking about the hook. It's a tune that's an earworm. You can't get it out of your. It's certainly Dull, the melody of that. Before... Mawkish. <laughs> We're going to have to agree to disagree on this one. There's only one in this Go on. that that brings me joy. That I no, there's, there's there's some stuff that's competent, but there's one in this that I, just, I love, which is Doja Cat say so. Which yeah, I think that's all right. Well, and, I, and part of the reason I love that is, is it's got this retro '70s groove. Yeah. yeah, all, all, yeah. Uh, although there's something in I don't know a lot about her, and there's something in her that troubles me, um, and I think. This is something I've, I've long wanted to talk, uh, ask you about, because I think she uses the N word in this, and there's yeah. loads of stuff. There's loads of stuff that uses the N word. And I, I always hate it. I think th this isn't a word that can be recuperated, and I, I would rather it. I'd rather we just got rid of it. Arguably, yeah. Um, it doesn't trouble me as much as you might think. It doesn't trouble me. Um, it's an uncomfortable word in certain situations. It is. 
um, not least, you know, in the old days, certainly if not still now today, you know, the that was the word of, uh, that was the battle cry of the racists that were coming after you. You know, they would certainly shout that out. And as Stephen Lawrence um, learned to his cost, that was the beginning of, the end in terms of you know some to, somebody trying to kill you for just being black but it doesn't trouble me the word itself we've got much you know i think a more um difficult uh difficult issues and even terms actually but it doesn't yeah. trouble me as much as you might think i think in the right circumstance when nwa did it I couldn't stop doing it. Do you know, if you're into your gangster rap, I'm afraid it's going to be very difficult to bypass that one. And so, like you said, sometimes you have to agree to disagree. Mm. Talking of which, um, like I said, there's a lot of grimy stuff in here, which is like the UK version, I think, of a lot of this rap stuff. And not grime stuff that necessarily uses the N-word either. Dave, not familiar with... Uh, I know my daughters love him very much, not familiar with a huge amount of his uh, work, but he's half decent track at number 100, Black. Uh, you've got Stormzy in there with, I thought, was a great groove, um, this Vossi Bop, don't ask me what it is, at number 82. Mm -hmm. um, spent a quarter of a million quid on the video is what I remember about it, and it is a decent and a half video. And a lot of these, uh, this era of music, the video is half of the um, artistic experience. Mm -hmm. So, well, which is a shame sometimes. If the music doesn't live up to it, then it is a shame. Um, Pop Smoke, for example, at number 73, and this is more kind of drill, drill, you, um, sorry, drill music rather than grime music. Uh, the UK stuff is a grime music, but number 73, you've got Pop Smoke, who um, had a future, had a future, had a really wicked uh, debut track called welcome to the party um did a decent video for it and all and then got shot dead and it was one of the uh sort you know like when you're going back to the n-word and that might be part of the challenge for a lot of uh uh rappers that that feeds a certain amount of um maybe race hatred you know um and I'm talking about sort of uh, perhaps uh, intra-racial hatred that you use the N-word, then you are immediately dismissive in a way of somebody. That is part of the landscape that uh, some of these rappers have to traverse. But anyway, he was just in L.A. doing some filming. He's from New York, Pot Smoke, from an immigrant family. Um, I think they're Haitians. I can't remember exactly. And... On a video, it showed him with some money. You know, these rappers are always showing their money, how much money they got. And uh, within a few hours of that, if not a day or so, um, he was shot dead by somebody going to rob him because in the video, they recognised um, the street that this, um, I think he was in an Airbnb or whatever in LA, and they recognised something on the street and they went there and... and, well, and it, it, isn't that a deplorable comment on our times? Absolutely. That, that, that whole story is just like wading through excrements, isn't it? The whole thing. Yeah, I wouldn't describe it like that personally, but I know what you're trying to get at. Um, it's a sad story, extremely sad said what i was going to say about pop smoke was that he just you know sometimes you lose some of the great artists around because of the nonsense that comes with them or they come with you know that's waiting for them as they die anyway uh so r.i.p pop smoke for me but there's a lot of other stuff uh at number 76 dave and burner boys locations much better than the tune that he's got at number 100 there's a lot of grime in this i don't know do you want to say anything more lash uh, on this um let's try and leave this or leave this if we can with, on a more positive note than thinking about the way the pop smoke died well, me talking about music is is rarely a positive note for anyone. I mean, there's a pretty far outside of my areas of 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 competence, but on a far more lighthearted note, maybe too lighthearted, even maybe this is a handbrake turn too far. But 
you know, Ellie Holland has been part of a music track. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen this ever. I'm sure Tim is well, nodding as if he has been subject. Have you not seen this? No, I've not seen it. Go I've, I've heard it? about so this it. One... I, haven't, I haven't seen it. So this was back in 2016 when he was away. He managed to, it was, he was, as I, from, as far as I can tell from the video, they must have been in Poland and that works with the date as well. He was away with the under 16s uh, to play some international or other and him and, uh, and and two of his teammates, uh, Eric Bortheim and uh, the other uh, defender, Eric Tobias Sandberg, who's the one people forget out of the three of them because Bortheim is also now a player in Serie A. But uh, yeah, uh, Eric, uh, Aling Holland, Eric Bortheim and Eric Tobias Sandberg uh, formed a some kind of impromptu pop trio and uploaded a track uh, called Kugo Yo uh, in reference to the popular Norwegian music producer and artist Kugo. Um, they under the name Flow Kings with a Z, and it's uh, very amateurish. Of course, it is because it's made by kids uh, who are just larking about, being bored on a downtime away for international duty, and you can tell they're just basically larking about in the hotel grounds. I think, B- but it's remarkable in the fact that it's still online. Like, is this clearly doesn't? It's quite cringe. Like, it's a uh, Erling Holland. You looks like a young boy. I mean, his his vocal efforts are not exactly in time. Uh, the, the, not not tremendous his sense of rhythm which we we say you can tell on the field that he has some kind of sense of rhythm it is not on display here uh obviously th- there's a lot to dislike about this track but i find it incredibly endearing that as he became famous he has never felt the need to have it taken down like the, 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 oh. there's someone who is n- not afraid to look foolish on the internet like i think it's a great sort of display of confidence from him to say i can have this uh, video of me looking like a gawky teenager rapping terribly uh, and, and it can be on the internet and people can laugh at me because I don't care because I'm going to score so many goals and be so wealthy that they can laugh all they want. It doesn't matter. Like, he's incredibly confident in himself in that regard. So I think it's that, to that, his that eternal really, it's, credit. That, that's the, the vibe that he gives off at all times isn't it? Of, of being comfortable in his skin. And I think that these, because it's it's two games, it's home and away. We've been looking at the 2-1 the, the, the win in the first leg. Paris Saint-Germain win 2-0 in, in the second leg in advance and go all the way to the final. And surely this is, on the one hand, it's the moment when Holland had announced himself to the world as this this kid is serious. But maybe it's also, and it's, it's amazing how quickly these things can go when you're dealing with special talent, it's the moment when you know he's not going to be at Dortmund for very long. Yeah. No, that's true. Uh, and I think already in those first few games for Dortmund, there were articles turning up saying, well, you better enjoy him while he's there, Dortmund fans, because there is a, the, the, he's he will be moving on at some point. But I, and and it is in, it's eternally fascinating to me how when PSG win the return leg, it was a very strange game. It was it was played behind closed doors because this is just at the outbreak of the COVID uh, crisis, um, and it's a very gnarly, uh, feisty game that because the PSG players were were annoyed after the first leg, partially because they kicked Neymar around like they clearly had a plan to give him a few kicks. He came into the first leg with a knock, and uh, Dortmund were quite intent on making that worse. I think I think this was pretty clear. And then after the game, when they won and Holland scored the goals, like the social media department at Dortmund went slightly, uh, they, yeah, they got ahead. They went slightly mad. Like they put out a lot of stuff about how. We don't sign stars, you know. We make them or something. Which is like, mate, you, you signed you signed Erling Holland from Salzburg a couple of weeks ago. Like, settle down, guys. But there was a, there was a lot of this, and I, I do think the PSG players took it a little bit to heart. There was also a fake uh, Snapchat post going around the day of the return leg of, of Erling Holland seemingly, you know, dissing Paris. And so it was, it was a picture of him and then sort of Paris is my city or so, some nonsense like this. Now, any sort of rudimentary amount of looking into this would have, you know, it would have been clear this was fake. Like, they wouldn't do this. Uh, but the PSG players appear to have been taken in a little bit by it. And so there was a lot of rage and anger in this game. Dortmund were not quite at their level. Holland, Holland had no service all game. It was a very no fans in the stadium. I mean, I, I think that was one of the least least happy evenings of his career so far, I would imagine. And then after the game, the PSG, with this, this lavish sort of project, who've always struggled to get anywhere in Europe, finally they've beaten someone. You know, they've avenged the first leg defeat. They've gotten past Dortmund. You know, they'll, they'll go on to make the final. This is a good team that's actually going somewhere. 
how do they celebrate? They all celebrate by doing the lotus position, like dissing this teenager yeah. who was who was playing in who was playing in Austria a few weeks earlier, you know. Uh, yeah. Which I just think the, the extent that's to a which he got, um, isn't it? it it's an that incredible compliment. compliment. Yeah. The extent to which he got under their skin exactly. uh, in that first leg exactly. is absolutely incredible, and, and 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 it's another sign of him just being an absolute superstar in the making. It's a, it's a so huge compliment where, to him. Where to from here for Erling Haaland? Um, will Manchester City uh, supporters be best advised to enjoy him? Whilst he's still here, because you know he's going to move on at yeah. some point. So I should stress for the avoidance of doubt that this is me speculating. Uh, just so we're clear on that, this is no sort of inside. No, think, think the initial plan was to maybe not stay there for too long. I think he is a player who would like to experience different things. I think he's more. I think he's more of a Zlatan, more of a Cristiano Ronaldo than he than he is a Messi. I think he's more likely to want to test himself in different environments than he is to find the club where he fits in and wants to stay there forever. But my feeling, and again, I'm speculating, is that this has gone better than expected so far. And I don't just mean winning the treble and scoring all the goals. I mean very specifically his fitness. Because there were concerns. Uh, there were starting to be concerns. I mean, he picked up, starting to pick up muscle injuries in, in Germany, especially that last season. He had a couple, a couple of not insignificant muscle problems. So, and we know that they were thinking about this because they've said it on the We Are Play documentary about his decision to go to City. He says it on the record that they were thinking about the physical toll of playing in England and uh, the extra games, and it, it's tough. And it's something they will have thought very, very carefully about. I suspect that they will have had pretty long conversations with City ahead of the move about, like, how, how exactly do you plan to look after the boy? And, you know, what, what how are we going to make this work physically? Because that's the big question. But, of course, it's been fine. He's had very, very few injury layoffs since he, since he came. And, in fact, I think he almost suffered a little bit towards the end of last season because he had more minutes in his legs than really any other season in his career because he hasn't played this many games since they fit for, for really. But but my point is, if if they can, if City have been so successful in managing his physique, and he looks very happy and at home in that team, so I suspect now it's possible that he might stay at City for longer than what may have initially been the plan. This is what we talk about run. two, three seasons, or what? It, it, a fair chunk of time. I think it's also a little bit tied to Guardiola as well, because. If Guardiola leaves at some point, then you have to question, okay, who comes in? How do I fit into that? Then everything is up in the air again. Uh, but I think for now, my feeling is that this has gone better than expected. Physically, there doesn't seem to be a problem. He's really taken to English football. I mean, Tim alluded to it earlier. He doesn't mind the violence of football. He really doesn't. And he is a player who, if yeah, if you get tough with him, he'll get tough right back. And we've seen it a few times at City. If, if he's a bit frustrated, he'll just go kick someone. Like He's very happy to get stuck in. So he, he fits England very well in that regard. I think arguably fits England better than a few other leagues around Europe. So almost as yeah, if he was born there. Almost as if he was born. <laughs> uh, so I think this is a uh, is a very happy union him in Manchester City right now. Yeah, and I can I can see that going on for just, for quite a few years. Just now. on that note, maybe he should have chosen England as his national team because you know he's not going to win anything with Norway, is he? I'm just going to leave that there for okay. a quick good, for the good. next time England okay. get hilariously knocked um, out by some uh, team or other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and no need. Thatcher will no doubt rise from the dead just for that pleasure for you. Um, by the way, number 54 in the charts is Circles by Post Malone, which is a wicked track. If you haven't listened to that, check it out. Okay, I think that's us done. Uh, Lars Sieverstens, ta- thank you very much. The book is called Holland, but what's the subtitle? called Hold On, the incredible story behind the world's greatest striker. It is out in all uh, good and some evil bookshops. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, which bookshop? The balance of probability. Be, like, yeah. the, the, yeah. Not all bookshops well, are yeah, which, Some of them, which, I don't which, know enough about yeah, them. Which sure bookstore could you possibly <laughs> be? Anyway, absolute pleasure Brilliant. talking Brilliant. Uh, to you about this <laughs> match, uh, Champions League match. 18th of February 2020, Dortmund versus PSG, uh, introducing Erling Haaland to the world. And Tim, yeah, not bad, eh? Not bad for a footballer. No, let's say, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to, and I loved some of the things that we found out from this conversation. 
about Holland's backstory. Uh, and uh, it's made me very much want to read the book, along, of course, with Efri's, uh, the, the memoirs of Dot and Adebayo. I think they'll be a re- they'd, they'd be a really good package. I think so. I've got Efri's here somewhere as well. It <laughs> might be in my suitcase or in, it might be in my work bag. It would be good if well, I had it funny right. Funny enough, I've got Holland here as well as Efri's. <laughs> 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 